So hello, welcome back from lunch. And uh, so now we're gonna hit, now we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is kind of go through examples of pointers and we'll follow through several different examples and talk about memory leaks and um, inaccessible, ob well, inaccessible object memory leaks, dangling pointers, this ampersand symbol. I'm not gonna repeat everything, but the new and the delete operator, new and delete used with classes and objects. So we're going to revisit pointers again to continue on with this. Um, so using the ampersand declaring variables, the dereference, the null pointer, the class destructor, the shallow copy versus the deep copy of objects, and then the copy constructor, which is what we're getting into this afternoon. So we can recall that our character string that we've been looking at in the morning is nothing more than a base address. It is a pointer. So we have the str right here, which is the base address of the array, and we say that str is a pointer because the value is the value for the starting address, and then we have as many as eight items in this particular case that we're putting into this. So we have 6,000 plus 6,001, 6,002, 6,003, all the way up to eight of those suckers. So it points to memory, location of a character. So what we can do here then is say that when a variable is declared, enough memory should hopefully be um, allocated to hold the data type that it's been allocated for. So if we had integer x, x might be this big, a float number might be this big, and a character might be this small actually compared to the rest of them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're stored sequentially. They're just picked. You just pick an address. The, the compiler just picks an address. And whatever address we get, we can actually get the address of. We can actually use the address of with anything. We can use it with, uh, well, if you pick the object name, you're actually getting the starting address. If you print out the object, if I made employee Barb, and I printed out Barb with nothing, I'm going to get the same concept. I'm going to get the memory address. So everything in the language is stored by memory addresses, and everything is implemented by pointers, actually. But the address of operator gets us more meaningful information. As an example, the address of x, the address of ant number, the address of character in this particular case. So the pointer variable itself is just a variable that holds the value of the memory address. And it is of a particular data type. It has to be a particular data type because we need to know how big to make the memory address. So how much memory are we going to actually store? That is why we have to give it a data type. Um, so we know how much we're allocating, and then we can only use a pointer of one data type with a pointer of the same data type. We can't mix and match data types either with the pointers, which is a common mistake. People think that they can, but that you can't. An integer is an integer, whether it's a pointer or not. You can't mix a pointer integer with a regular integer either. They're two different variables, two different types. So here we have the example with the asterisk. We've seen this already. So using a pointer variable. So here, here's the examples I was talking about. So if you have integer x and then x is equal to 12, over here we have x, it's at memory address 2000, it's equal to 12. And then over here we have integer pointer, pointer, pointer is equal to the address of x, well then pointer is actually holding 2000, because it's the address of x and x is at memory address 2000, although it's storing the value of 12. And then at integer PTR, this pointer here, is actually at memory address 3000. So because PTR holds the address of x, we say that PTR points to x in this particular case. So PTR is pointing to x because it's holding 2000. And then we have the dereference that goes along with the reference is the indirectional dereference. So if we did this here, what we're looking at then with these little memory pictures here is if we uh, see out follow PTR we're going to follow PTR, which is holding a memory address 2000. We go to memory address 2000. At memory address 2000 is the number 12, so it would print out the number 12. So note that the value pointed to by PTRs are denoted by the follow or the dereference operator. So follow PTR. So here's what's happening when we follow PTR and change the value and make it equal to 5. Could we hold the volume down in the back? Oh, thank you. So integer x, x is equal to 12. Uh, integer pointer, PTR. PTR is equal to the address of x. This is the same thing we had before. We'll follow PTR and have it equal to 5. It changes the value at the address that PTR is pointing to, and it changes it to 5. 
So it doesn't change anything inside of PTR. It's still pointing to the memory address 2000, but it's changing that 12 and turning it into a 5. So here's another example with a character. So we have a character. When we do this line of code here, character ch, then we get this. Here's ch. So we put a name on it. We call it ch. With the pointer, we just don't put a name on it, which is the only big difference. We say ch is equal to a. Well, we put a in here. And then in the next line of code, we said character with an asterisk q. So we got q right here. We still have a, we're still putting a name on it. We're just a pointer name instead of a memory name. And then now we're saying q is equal to the address of ch. So q is now equal to 4,000. So q is holding the memory address of a ch, which is 4,000. And then uh, follow q and have it equal to z. So follow q, have it equal to z. So now this is crossed out. Now it's equal to z. So it's, if we print it out ch, we're going to get z. And then uh, character pointer p. Here's character pointer p. And then p is equal to q. Well, p here is equal to q. Well, q is 4,000. So now p is equal to 4,000. So now p can follow all the way up and change a to z. So, so the value of the right-hand side has a 4,000. p and q are both pointing to the same one, which is what we're doing with that linked list, actually. So use a pointer to access elements in a string. So let's take a little string, uh, scroll through our string stuff that we looked at this morning. We have character message, and it's hello. So it comes out here and says hello. This is a line return, but this null character is at the end in this spot over here. And it is at memory address 3001, or 3000, oh, excuse me, it's at memory address 3000. <coughs> and then we're going to create a character pointer, PTR. And PTR is going to be equal to a message. This is legal because of all the stuff I gave you this morning, if you were paying attention. Character arrays and strings are compatible. So this is a character array, not a string. Uh, this is a character array and a string. So PTR could be equal to message. <laughs> They're both compatible, although they look different. Follow PTR, have it equal to M. Well, what's PTR? It's PTR, which is character. PTR is going to be equal to message. Well, what's message? The starting address of message is 3,000. So PTR is at memory address 3,000. It's going to follow it up here, and it's going to change the H to an M. And then guess what? We can go PTR++. plus plus. So what's that going to go? 3,001. So if you know that integers are stored as the index values for the character array, and we have eight of them, we have 3,000 through 3,008. So the main memory address, and maybe you might understand at this point why we don't store a number, why we start with zero. We start with zero because that memory address of the first starting address is the base address. And then we go plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one to a length of 8, if we have 8. In this particular case, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because of the null character that's at the end. So we have 1, 000, we have 3,000 through 3,006 is our memory address. So we can go 3,000 plus plus with this line of code here. So PTR plus plus, that's legal. And now we're going to 3,001, 3,002, 3,003, 3,004, 3,005, 3,006, so we get to the end. We can actually even take that null character off if we want. We don't want to because we want to keep it as a string, but we could. We could take, we can remove the null character easily doing this. Follow PTR and have it equal to A after we've incremented it. Now we have MA instead of HE. So this is the important note here. It increments the address in PTR legal because these are whole single value integers for each of the array indexes, so it's incrementable by one, which is kind of interesting. And here's a string length, and we're going to pass the, uh, we're using the keyword constant in here because we're going to pass an array, character array, to a string length method that we created here. And in the string length method, we're going to count it up. So how are we going to count it up? This is the interesting part. We take a, and create a character pointer, p, and then we have an integer counter, 0, so it'll be our counter. p is going to be equal to the string. Well, string is the character array we took in from the parameter. While follow p doesn't equal null, 
count plus plus, p plus plus. Why bother with all the indexing? <laughs> Don't have to. We can actually do the increments they address by p by the size of character because p is a character. So we know we're storing characters. So we go character plus plus plus. So sometimes you'll see this, and this confuses a lot of people who are just now trying to get a concept on arrays, and pointers. Well, forget about arrays and pointers and just increment them like variables. Because <laughs> you know they're storing memory addresses. You can just increment the memory address. So it's a kind of a, a, a cheat sheet kind of way of getting through it, which uh, works great. I shouldn't say it's a cheat sheet way. It's just uh, you know one, one of the options that you have. So this, the rest of this lecture is kind of something I've gone through already, but we're going to kind of hit some more examples here in terms of some of the C++ pointer operations. So in terms of the pointer operations, we know that this, this operator here is the selection for, um, we know it's for objects and for structures, and now so we know we can use the plus plus, the minus minus, we can use the not. We have the, de the reference to dereference, and then we have this word new. New is actually the allocator and deletes the deallocator, as we've seen before. So let's take a look at some of the things with new. We can create a new array using the new array with a data type along with the integer expression. Or we can just use new on its own with a data type. So in memory, if it's available, it's allocated on what's called the heap, or the free store, which is in the dynamic area of the process space, and not on the stack. So new allocates a request of the object of the array and returns a pointer, or the address of, the memory address that it gives you. So when you say new, it's just, give me a new memory address. What do you want a new of, a new person, or a new employee, or a new structure, or uh, a new integer, or a new float? It just tells you what size. So you say new, what size you want, gives you a memory address of where it is, here it is. Otherwise the program terminates with an error if it can't find memory. You do. We will eventually run out of memory. So dynamic allocated objects exist until the delete operators destroy. They never go away. So they don't follow scope rules. So when you use new, it's permanent until you go delete to get rid of it. No scope rules. So if I opened up a function, and in the function I said new this, new that, new that, and I left the function, I still have all that stuff around. It's called garbage at this point. <laughs> We also have a null pointer. So there's a pointer a constant zero called null, and it denotes null, N-U-L-L, -L, in the header. And this is the include file if you don't have the standard namespace being loaded automatically. But null is not an empty memory address zero, and it doesn't equal zero. It equals null, which is kind of interesting. So it's an error to dereference a pointer where the value is null. It'll always generate an error. So the error will cause the program to crash or behave erratically. So we always test it and go, while the pointer doesn't equal null, use the pointer. So we have three kinds of program data, static data, automatic data, and dynamic data. I've been talking about static and dynamic, uh, but to give you the formal definition, static exists throughout the execution of the program, but it's controlled by the runtime. So the operating system is actually controlling it. Programmers are never controlling any static data, which is kind of interesting. As opposed to the dynamic data, which is all controlled 100% by the programmer, the runtime environment has no clue what you've allocated. It doesn't even work with it. You have your own access to your own memory, memory locations inside your process space. When you go new, you're going to allocate and delete. You're going to deallocate. So can you do new and delete on pre-existing objects that are part of the stack? Sure, why not? You can actually get rid of a lot of stuff with new and delete if you're allocating and deallocating correctly. The only problem is there's extra overhead because the program has to take care of it. So there's this thing called an automatic data where it's created and it's a function entry resides in the stack or in the activation records as a, which are part of the stack concept. And then they're destroyed when you return from a function. So certain things in the language like a, a return statement will um, destroy data. It gets rid of stuff automatically for you. So you can use this automatic data instead of having to do everything manually. So when you start out with C++, normally people start doing everything statically. You know, they, they just don't worry about pointers, you don't worry about objects. But when you start working with objects, then you figure out, well, your program's going to run better. Will it still work without the dynamic data? Sure, no problem. You can rely upon automatic or static data concepts. 
But you're gonna have a very slow running program. No one's gonna want to buy it. No one's gonna want to use it. So instead, you make dynamic data to make it more efficient. So the allocation of the memory is also a concern. Sometimes you write a program, you compile it just fine, and you double click on it, and you run it, and it doesn't run. You get out of memory errors immediately. And that's because it's statically allocated and you over allocated. The program's too big. If you write a database application, this will happen practically every time. Unless you dynamically allocate. Which means don't try to load everything up in the memory because you're going to run out of memory. Because imagine the concept you have everything that's running on the computer is in its own separate process, all allocated the same amount of memory per process. It's averaged. If you have a really heavy program that's using a lot of memory, it's definitely not going to be average. It's going to be a little bit more time, more, more memory consumption than the average. So it's definitely going to take up more memory. So static allocation is allocated at compile time. Dynamic is allocated at run time. So we can run one thing, let it go. Run another thing, let it go. Run another thing, let it go. We can constantly switch back and forth using new and delete. And we get a better memory management platform than we do if we uh, do things, everything statically. Which is kind of ironic because Java is all dynamic. <laughs> Java doesn't use any static memory at all. Which is kind of interesting. Half the program won't even load at the beginning. Nothing is done at compile time. It's all done at runtime. Until you need a class object, it doesn't even get loaded. And when it does get loaded, then it gets garbage collected automatically for you. But C++ does not have any automatic garbage collection and no dynamic running of anything unless the programmer does it itself with new and delete. Which is um, different. Does that mean that uh, there's any pros and cons to that? Well, you can save it for your CSLO essay. <laughs> you can compare and contrast. Actually, that might make an interesting essay topic. Compare and contrast memory management with Java and C++. And then you'll notice why people like Java, because it's safer. They, they call the language safer because the JVM manages all the memory. You don't leave anything to the programmer to have to do. That's safer. You let the programmer do it, the programmer's going to. It's human error. It's not that we're trying to be unsafe, it's just we make errors. So this is dynamically allocated data. When we say, yeah, uh, this does not happen at compile time, this happens at runtime. Which means we don't error check it. Which means pointers and dynamic, anything dynamic in the language is not error checked. There's no compilation error that's going to come out of that. Instead, you're going to compile the program, it's going to run, and it's going to crash on you. And you're going to want to crash. It's like reading past the uh, uh, length of an array, that's not checked either. So here's the pointer that's going to be equal to a new character. So that's uh, different. Instead of the address of another variable, we're actually creating one. So we get new one out here. When we do new character, we get 2000. We've got pick the address 2000. So now PTR is holding the address 2000. And uh, we follow PTR and we have it equal to B. And when we print out PTR, we're going to get B to the screen, same as before. And here's our character, new character, follow PTR, have it equal to B, print it out. So dynamic has no variable name. There's no name that's associated with it. There's just a memory address. When we looked at the previous examples and we said, well, it's equal to the address of X or something. That was a named. So that's called named variables. These are unnamed anonymous variables. So we follow PTR, we have it equal to B. Well, PTR is 2000. So if you were to think of this as a memory address, it's following to, and, it, and it, it's holding 2000, it's going to follow 2000. Here's 2000 out here, have it equal to B. When we delete it, we're going to delete it right here. We do allocate, so we delete through the reference. It doesn't have to be the same reference that created it, it could be any reference. But when we type in delete PTR, PTR still exists. PTR is the pointer. It's pointing to the memory address 2000, but it's no longer holding on to anything valid. Because we delete the allocated memory through the reference to it, a reference to it, any reference will work. And so when we delete it, the delete deallocates the memory pointed to by the PTR, so it takes it away. So using the delete operator, delete returns uh, to the free store any memory that was previously allocated uh, by new. It will only release what was allocated with new. It does not release any static data. It doesn't work with static data. But it's funny because you can take static 
it can create a new int. What was an int? It's normally static data, but you're going to create a new one with new. Then you can delete that int. So you can delete integers, floats, doubles, strings. As if you created them with new, you can delete them. If you just create them like integer i, can't do anything with it. It's automatically controlled by the runtime environment. So the object or the array currently being pointed to by the pointer is deallocated, and the pointer is then considered unassigned. It's called a dangling pointer at that point. This creates what's called a dangling pointer. So you want to know that for the final, because I'm going to have you know dangling pointer versus memory leaks versus inaccessible objects, which is a memory leak. So when you delete PTR, PTR is now pointing to something that's been deleted. So in the next line of code, you go PTR is equal to null. And then once you've equaled it to null, you have not created a dangling pointer anymore. Now you have a pointer that knows it's not pointing to anything valid. So dangling pointer is a pointer that's pointing to something that's been deleted. Or is, maybe it was deleted by somebody else, who knows, but it's no longer there anymore. You follow that pointer, you're going to get garbage. If you follow it, you get garbage, it's dangling. So. No, um, a dangling pointer is pointing to something that was deleted. So it is uh, invalid. So you always take this here, as I mentioned, let me just repeat myself for a second. You always take this here. The next line of code should be PTR is equal to null. So we can check for null. If it's not null, then we know it's pointing to something valid. A memory leak is when we move this pointer away without deleting it. So the memory is still there. So this piece of memory is still out there, but we're no longer pointing to it anymore. <coughs> it becomes an inaccessible object because nothing's pointing to it. We have no name. There's no name because we didn't have it. Uh, we, we said new, and we did not. We don't get a name. We just get an address that comes back that gets stored. So we can't even access it by its name or anything because it doesn't have one. Instead, it's inaccessible, and that becomes a memory leak because if we do that often enough, we leak out the amount of available memory. So it reduces our memory pool to the point where we eventually run out of memory. So it's leaked out because it's allocated, but it's never deallocated, which means we can't reuse it. When we deallocate it with delete, we can go ahead and use that memory space again. It's reusable. Once you allocate it, it won't be able to be used by anybody until you deallocate it, which is why people like dynamic memory, actually. You can leave it alone for the life of the program. <laughs> never goes away. You can send it to a function. And when you when you go to the function, is what you're doing in one of the assignments I went over, you go to the function and it changes it. Well, the memory address is still there whether you're in the function or not. So you leave the function and you can still access that memory address for the life of the program. When the program dies, so does the memory address. But uh, that's, you know, the end of the program. Uh, so let's see. The object or the array currently being pointed to is deallocated with the delete. So here's a, a dynamic array allocation. So we have a character, pointer. So PTR is a pointer variable that can hold the address of a character. And then we have a character is equal to new character five. Just when you thought you were done so looking at arrays. <laughs> this is a dynamically allocated array. What we were looking at before were statically allocated arrays. What does that mean? Well, Kind of the same thing, except for now we can delete this one. We couldn't delete the other one. So you made this huge array. You only used half of it. You did it statically. It's still taking up the memory while the program is still running. You can't get rid of it. So you do it this way, so it runs at runtime. It allocates. You don't use it all. You get rid of it. Get rid delete it. So dynamically during runtime, you allocate memory for five character arrays and store the base stress in PTR. So this is still the same syntax as before, character PTR, but instead of it equal to um, you know, an array, we're going new character 5. Same as before in the new and the data type, but this time we're saying 5 characters. Still no name, no name to this at all. So we have PTR, which holds the address 6000. We can go PTR++ all over again and get to every one of those 5 characters. It's going to go plus plus a character size. If it were a float, it'd go plus plus a float. If it were a structure or an object, it goes plus plus an object. <laughs> same, same concept. It just moves one ahead, which is interesting, actually. Um, so here's an example. Same as before, creating PTR. And it's going to be equal to a new character. 
We're going to string copy into PTR by. So by got put in here. And so now we have a pointer that's dynamically allocated with no name to it, but we have PTR now that's pointing to it. So we're using PTR like an array, PTR1, PTR2, PTR3. So we're taking a new character array that doesn't have a name. Instead of using the name, we're going to use a PTR. Well, what if we had um, STR equal to PTR? Then we can go STR1, STR2, 3. So it gives us more flexibility. We can change the name, assign it to somebody else, and still get each one of the indexes that way, which is kind of weird, different. So PTR1, change it to, to change it to U. So this one changes it to U. So. And remember, we're getting this null character at the end uh, because we're have, we have a string here. Well, it's up here, too. It's a string character array, which puts the, puts the null character at the end. And then we're having it equal to new 5. Kind of an odd concept, I think, actually. So, in fact, most people, sometimes they go, is there a null character or is there no null character? <laughs> And then you have to think about it. It's like, how did I create that? Well, actually, believe it or not, it got created with this here. So, but because we're using this, it can be of any length. So we, we're just saying allocate. Give me five. So what happens if we go past six or seven? It's going to do it. It's going to work. But we don't know what we're writing into. It could be somebody else's memory. It could be another variable that we've written that we're using. But because we put the two quotes here, we always get we always get that null character at the end. Before we did this, we don't have it. If we just did character 1, 2, 3, 4, we just put characters in there, no null character. We're not going to have this at the end here. But it's these guys here that are causing the null character to come in. This here isn't going to do anything. No null character is going to be affected with that. But we could go to 0, 1, 2, 3 and change the null character to uh, u, and it works. We've just destroyed our string. Well, not really. We just took out the null character is what we did. So, I don't know. Nobody likes to remo remove the null characters. Usually people want to put it in. And you can put it in manually. You created a character array and you want to turn it into a string. Well, just put a null character at the end. Just add it to the string. Add it as the last element of the character array. And then you got the string. Turn the character array into a string. So here's our delete. Interesting thing is that both of them work, but if you leave out this, you don't get all the pluses. You don't get everything. You just get the starting address. So if I were to delete this here, this PTR, and I were to put in the, uh, the brackets, and I just did this line up here, delete pointer, delete PTR, it deletes 6,000, but it leaves the rest of it. <laughs> works. You think it works just fine, actually, until you run out of memory. But if you put the brackets in, it takes and finds everything to that null character and removes it completely all the way up to there. Automated. So if the value of the pointer is zero, there's no effect. Otherwise, an object or the array currently pointed to by the object is deallocated. If the object is pointing to null, there's no effect. You can't delete a null. So nothing happens to it. So it's a... Uh, and the value of the pointer is undefined after you delete it, so the memory is returned to the free store to square brackets are used to delete a dynamically allocated array. Only dynamically allocated arrays require the, the, the opening and closing brackets. So this one here, we uh, created PTR. Now we said PTR is equal to new character, and we copied by into it. And then we changed it to U. And then we said delete PTR. So we deallocated the array pointing to by PTR. PTR itself is not deallocated and the value of PTR is undefined. And the rest of the array is still there. <laughs> so we, we just deleted the first one. The rest of this stuff is now called garbage. Well, usually if it's small like that, nothing's going to happen. So. so what happens here? Let's see. We have a integer pointer, new int, follow int, make it equal to 3. So here we go here. Uh, pointer is equal to new int. Oh. Follow pointer, have it equal to 4. Go 4 in here. That's the memory leak. Because this object's now inaccessible. So we've created a memory leak. An inaccessible object. Nothing's pointing to it. It's inaccessible. 
An accessible object is an unnamed object that was created by the operator new, but which the programmer was left, they left it out there without appointing anything to it, and they didn't delete it. So if we did this, we can say follow PTR have it equal to 8, and make a new pointer if you're going to do another new and have it equal to negative 5. How else can the object become inaccessible by switching the pointer, having PTR equal to PTR2? Mm, uh oh, or, or other scenarios that might exist. So, yeah, here it is here. PTR is equal to PTR2. So they're both equal to the same one now instead of them both equal to their own. We do this with objects all the time, actually, um, which is why programmers they like to use new, new employee, new something or other, because then you're, you have more control over the allocation and deallocation of it. So the memory leak, by definition, is the loss of the available memory space that occurs when the dynamic memory is never deallocated. Here's our dangling pointer terminology. It's a pointer that points to dynamic memory that has been deallocated, as I was mentioning before. So this one creates the memory leak, because this guy is gone. Now, we could leave the, a dangling, leaving a dangling pointer if we said here, this is we started with this, and now we delete PTR2, and PTR2 we set to null, but PTR1 was equal to PTR2. Common mistake, actually. Now PTR2, or PTR1 is now dangling. Different than a memory leak. So, I, excuse me, different than... Uh, Different than an inaccessible object, different than it's the dangling pointer generally occurs after you delete something and you discover you had more than one item pointing to it. Because this is a no brainer. If we set PTR equal to null, we fixed the pointer that we deleted the memory through, but we didn't, we forgot about PTR up here. This one's the dangling pointer, this one's not dangling. It's out there, it's not pointing to anything. So. By definition, a pointer that's not pointing to something valid is a dangling pointer. One that's not pointing to something is set to null is not dangling. We already know it's null. Well, the problem is, how do we know about this one? Well, remember it somehow? <laughs> and if you rely upon human memory, then you might as well forget that one. You're going to create dangling pointers. Is that dangling pointer going to be a problem? Only if you try to go to what, if you try to follow it because you can't test it anymore. You can't test it to see if you can follow to it. All the other ones you can say, if it's not null, well this one's not going to be null, so this one's going to cause a problem eventually. Who knows, maybe it won't. So here's a dynamic array class, as so we could put it together here, we, so we can have a public, here's our constructor, this is going to be a size. So we can create what's called a dynamic array that gets past the issues that are associated with a uh, static array. The static array doesn't change in size, but a dynamic array could actually, if we're allocating memory. So we're still initializing it with a size, and then we see this thing over here and we go, what in the world does that? And we go, well, that's a copy constructor. So when we're doing this inside of a class, and in this particular case, that's what we're doing in this dynamic array. We're using new to create memory. And then we go ahead and we make a copy of ourselves. And how do we make a copy of ourselves? Well, when we do an assignment, this is a copy. When we say PTR is equal to PTR2, this is what's called an assignment expression. It makes a copy. So we're now copied, which means we're both pointing to the same memory address. Normally, you know, do we want that? If we don't want that, we make a copy constructor. <laughs> copy constructor takes, let's say, the value that's stored here, copies it to a new memory address, and makes this point to the new one. Because we don't want it pointing to the same one, otherwise it's not a true copy. Which is kind of interesting. So the copy constructor actually makes a true copy when assignment is done. So. And this is uh, what the copy constructor looks like. It actually looks exactly like the constructor, except for one thing that's very important is this parameter in here. It takes a reference to itself. So you see in here dynamic array, and we see, and this is an ampersand, the address of another. 
So it takes for an equality the input is itself it, the input into itself is a copy of another object. So it takes the other object into itself, creates its own new memory, copies the other object's values, and puts them into our new memory. And then we have a true copy that's made. That's called a deep copy. A shallow copy, you leave out the copy constructor. And you get whatever memory address the original was pointing to, the copy is now pointing to it. So the copy constructor here is uh, creates a deep copy. So it creates a deep copy of the other array that it takes on as a parameter. It uses a constant here because we don't want to change the other one accidentally. Whenever we're working with memory, there's always that kind of concept where, you know, it's like we could possibly, we could possibly change that address somehow. Uh, where, you know, we don't want to. So we take a reference. So another trivia question on the final exam is going to be something, well, what's the difference between, a, how, how can you differentiate a copy constructor in your class? It's the only constructor that's allowed to take a copy of itself, to take a reference of the same data type. If you did this with a, you can't do it with a constructor. It won't allow it. So, and it, but it takes the same name as the constructor. But you must always have to put a reference in there, so it's always taking a reference to itself. Same object type. Implicitly closed for instantiation. And then here we have the deconstructor. We've seen that before. It has the tilde in front of it. Deconstructor can never take on a parameter. It, you're not passing. It never get passed. This you call. You call it through overloading. And I'm going to talk about overloading operators later. Uh, probably next, actually. <laughs> so when we... Uh, when we do this, we're doing it implicitly, not explicitly. So we can't call a copy constructor, we can't call a constructor, and we can't call a deconstructor. But this one gets passed through overloading of the operator, and the operator is the equals operator for assignment. It also happens when you take and make a copy by value. When you send a copy pass by value into a function, it makes a copy for you as well. So the destructor here is just going to delete most of the memory that's associated with the, uh, well, everything that's associated with the dynamically allocated memory. Then we have integer value at to void store, uh, different methods. So what do we get with the class dynamic array? We get something that looks like this. So at uh, memory address 6000, we have these items that are being put into it for the array that we're going to create. And we have a size of 5, let's say, for example. Why is a destructor needed? Well, when the class goes out of scope, when the memory space for the data member size or the array is deallocated, when you remove the object, the destructor works too. So you delete the object, you create an employee, an employee's got something in there to do height. You remove the employee, well, you're going to remove the height, is what we did actually. But the dynamically allocated array points to pointer to is not automatically deallocated. So the object itself is deallocated, the destructor inside of the object deallocates anything that the object allocated. It's a chain reaction. And the destructor only deallocates memory that it allocated because the new and delete has to work in pairs. So if the object created it, the object owns it, object can remove it. <laughs> you can't delete it through the outer delete that's going to delete the object. Because you're just deleting the object you created with new. Inside of the object, it created its own news. So in order to get rid of that, you have to have the object do it. In order to have the object do it, because you can't do it, you have to have a destructor in there. And the destructor will automatically delete it when it gets deleted. So it's a chain reaction. It's kind of weird. Um, I did this once, and I decided it's too confusing. You can go through about three lines of hierarchy. You allocate data in each one of them. <laughs> And you see so you trigger by deleting the highest one in the hierarchy. It deletes the highest one, and it goes backwards, and it deletes this object, deletes this object, deletes this object. But you see inside the outer object, and then the inner object, and the outer object, and then the <laughs> inner objects. It's actually kind of funny how they all delete backwards. So it's kind of complicated to put together, and then once you get done putting that together, you go, oh, stupid. <laughs> I don't want to do that again. So, But yeah, it's kind of fun to do that. Also, you know, it's like actually kind of fun to send something to a stack allocated, send a, send a pointer to a stack allocated 
Oh, that's good. actually that's pretty interesting. Set a pointer to a stack allocated uh, function, like like a function. Actually, a function would do it. Inside of the function, create an object. Put a destructor inside of the object that's inside of the function. Uh, the scope changes from outside of the function, goes back to main. The function is stack allocated, so it leaves the stack. And then the objects, the outer objects, never get deleted, but the memory inside of the objects do. <laughs> because the destructors will trigger when the object goes out of scope, but the objects never deallocated because you didn't delete the objects. But the inside, the destructors will actually fire inside as it leaves because the object thinks it's being deleted because it's left the scope. When you do new and you leave the scope, it leaves garbage unless you delete. But if you've left garbage, the garbage actually knows it's garbage and the destructors will, will trigger without the... So you only want to delete it. When you delete it, you'll see both of them trigger. But if you don't delete it, you just leave it. Sometimes you'll get it, depending upon the scenario that you're working with, you'll get the destructors to fire. <laughs> you put a little C out in there. And you go, hey, destructor fired. Hey, but the object's still there. So it's not really an orphan. It's a, a demon memory, no longer accessible by anybody. So it's garbage. Uh, so the class destructor is used to deallocate the dynamic memory pointed to by the data member. So here's our destructor. This is what the code looks like in our a dynamic array. And we do it the same thing when we implement it in the C++ file. We use the scope resolution operator, and we put the tilde in there. And we go delete with the uh, array symbols, because it's an array that we created. And we are deleting the array that we created with new in this particular example. So when the function is called that uses a pass by value, a class object for, let's say, dynamic type, what happens? Well, it doesn't. Pass by value never makes a copy. Pass by va sending a reference as a pass by value is an oxymoron because you're not sending it. You're sending it. The reference never gets copied. The reference is a reference. <laughs> so you can't send a reference as a value. Even if you put constant on there, you're not doing it. You're just not changing anything. So passing a class object by value, you actually have to make it a reference to make it a value, which is kind of backwards, but it seems to be the case. So, well, it is the case. It's, this is actually called a shallow copy. So pass by value creates a shallow. If you want it to actually make a copy, you have to implement a copy constructor and make a deep copy out of it. Deep copy goes out to that memory, takes what's there, digs another hole somewhere else, and sticks it there. <laughs> So you have two instead of one. You got to do that. And is it really a copy? No, but it makes a copy because it's two different memory addresses. It's not going to be an identical copy. So it's, it's kind of weird. It's if you think about the logic to it, it's backwards. To make a copy, you got to not make a copy. You have to make a deep. You have, you have to actually allocate more memory for it to not make a copy of it. Otherwise, if you make a copy of the reference, both everything is referencing the same memory. And so there's going to corrupt it. It's not really a copy. So we have some function out here. And some function here is taking this dynamic array as a parameter. And this is a pass by value because we're sending it the array, which is actually kind of funny because arrays are always sent by, val are sent by reference when you send it by value. If you send an array to a function, you're passing it by value, but it's always treated like a reference. That's why you have to use the keyword constant in there, because if you don't do that, you're going to change what's in the array. So by default, pass by value makes what's called a shallow copy. And here's our shallow copy. Shallow copy is out here, but you see this is the original and this is the copy. So we have this copy that was made because we called it uh, some array out here. It's a dynamic array. Send it to some function. So we have beta sum array. They're both dynamic arrays. And uh, we have the code here. We, we've sent it beta. So we have two of them. But they're both pointing to the same memory address 2000. Because inside there we created a dynamic array of characters. And uh, both copies, it's shallow because both copies are pointing to the same memory address. It's using the same copy. So shallow copy versus deep copy. Shallow copy copies only the class data members and does not make a copy of any pointed to data by definition. 
A deep copy copies not only the class data members, but also makes a separate stored copy of any pointed to data. That's what we need the copy constructor for. Copy constructors make deep copies. <laughs> hmm, and you're like, well, what's the difference? Shallow copy shares the pointing to dynamic data's original class is shared. Deep copy makes its own copy. Is a deep copy really a copy? No, there's two separate memory addresses. It's not identical. There's not an identical twin. It's definitely a altered copy. Um, so making a separate deep copy here, we have 2,000. Now we have 4,000. Two different memory addresses as deep copy. So that's being used in this context. So the initialization of class objects defines initialization. So we had the variable declaration passing an argument by value initializes it and returning an object as a return value of a function causes an initialization. By default C++ uses a shallow copy for all of these. Just think when in doubt it uses a shallow copy unless you implement your copy constructor. If you do that then it's going to make a deep copy. So the programmer decides when the deep copy is going to be made. As a result when a class has a data member pointer data, a dynamically allocated data, when you're using dynamically allocated data inside of the class, you should write what's called a copy constructor. And implicitly called in the initialization, initialization situations. It makes a deep copy of the dynamic data in a different memory location. And just to review one more, one more moment here. When we make the variable declaration, we initialize it. When we say employee barb, that's an initialization. We pass it to a function, we pass it by value, we're also initializing it. Because we're initializing a temporary copy of it inside of the function that we're sending it to. Send barb in and this function takes employee x. Now we have x and barb. Then we have another initialization of x that comes in there. We can return the object from a value. We, so we can say return barb or return x. It also gets initialized because it goes back into main, gets initialized. All three of those times we can uh, do a copy constructor to protect the main memory or protect the allocated memory, dynamically allocated memory. So when there's a copy as well, so when there's a copy constructor provided for the class, the copy constructor is used to make the copies for pass by value. Do you not, you can't call a copy constructor explicitly um, like the other constructors, there's no return type either. It never returns anything. None of the constructor, deconstructor, or copy constructor, none of them return anything. And because the copy constructor properly defines pass by value for your class, you must use a pass by reference in its definition. It's the only constructor that's allowed to take a reference. It's the only one that takes a reference. It can't send a reference. Where are you going to reference? When you make a new copy, when you make a new instance of something, there's nothing to reference. And when you delete something, you can only delete what you own. So you're not going to make a reference to that either. In fact, the delete doesn't take on any arguments at all. So, so copy constructor is a special member function of the class implicitly called with three situations. So when does a copy constructor get called? When you pass an object parameters val by value. So automatically when you send the object by value to a function, copy constructor is going to invoke for you. You get it. Initialize an object variable in its declaration. Uh, employee B is equal to barb. Copy constructor is going to make it so it, B doesn't equal to barb's allocated memory. It, it's, it, B is equal to its own allocated memory. It's going to take a copy of Barb stuff and put it inside of its own space to make a deep copy of anything that Barb might be allocating. And return an object as a return value of a function when you return it back. So there's sadistic people, instructors that take and say, well, here's a great assignment actually. <laughs> I'm not going to do it to you guys, but uh, you know, um, for everything, actually, you can invoke all of the constructors. So you write a program that takes and creates all three all three ways of making a copy. The two-ish ways of deleting it, and all of the different combinations of the constructors, 
And then you see all the automation C++ puts into the um, object as a concept. And then when you write your CSLOS and you compare it to Java, what does Java give you? A constructor. <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of this other stuff. It's all done for you by the JVM. And then you go, oh, that's why people like Java. It's easier. Yeah, yeah. There's no such thing as a copy of anything. The entire language is by reference, but you never have to use a pointer. There's no such thing as a pointer symbol in that language. And then there's no copy constructors. There's no deep or shallow copy stuff. There's no deconstructor. There's nothing like that. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But it's kind of interesting. Uh, until you study C++, you don't really understand the concept. When you learn Java, you don't understand half of this stuff because you don't have to work with it. And then you go from Java to Objective-C, which is all pointer and dynamically allocated, but it's a hybrid between C++ and Java. Then you go, oh, you know, there's pointers. Why do I have to make everything a pointer? Why do I have to use new with everything? You can still use new in Java. You just don't have to go delete. Well, you don't have to actually delete anything in Objective-C anymore either. You have automatic reference counting. So automatic reference counting just keeps track of what you've allocated and what you're referencing. If you're not referencing it anymore, get rid of it. it. Takes it up there for you. No, no, so you never have to say delete for anything. So it is kind of interesting, although people don't like it when I compare languages. It's kind of interesting to think about the implementation. What is programming? It's all the same, right? When you program something, it's most of the syntax these days is almost identical between different languages. But some languages have a tendency to lean a different direction towards their implementation style, and other languages have different characteristics associated with them. And you can kind of see when you're trying to pick out, this is more of a programming language concepts thought, but when you're trying to pick out a language to use for a program, would I use Java for something that was very low level? No. Can I write a device driver with Java? No. I can't allocate memory with Java. How am I going to write a device driver with it? It's practically impossible. Um, can I write a, you know, an applet with C++? No. <laughs> or an app. Excuse me, not an applet. Or an app. No. Can you use anything in the internet with C++? Barely with ASP. Or, excuse me, with .NET, whatever. But long story short, the languages themselves have just put themselves into categories by their features to allow for different capabilities. But a programming language is a programming language terms of its implementation, but it's more than just learning the syntax, it's learning what is good about the language, what its pros and cons are. You know, Java's more reliable, C++ is more controllable, definitely more controllable than Java, uh, but not as reliable. Uh, how much error checking is done between the two compilers? Well, Java doesn't do any error checking. Well, it does, but it's all runtime. It's all dynamically checked statically on the C++ end when maybe so is it harder to get a C++ program to compile? Yeah, sure. There's a lot more checks that are being done to a C++ program. Will the Java thing compile? Oh yeah, it'll compile just fine. Will it run? Probably not. <laughs> many, many classes compile just fine in Java. They don't run because there's fundamental issues that weren't checked. They weren't checked at compile time. So you've got issues that will happen later on. So, and it's pros and cons. So, all right, here's a going back, slight de deviation here. Copy constructor creates a pass by value. So, it's a deep copy. So, now we're making a deep copy so we can copy by value instead of by reference. And suppose some function calls store and store here is going to. Oh, we have pass by value, and we're going to use this function in here. And then we're going to, everything has changed, so we're going to come back here with a shallow copy, and we're going to use something that was allocated that wasn't copied, unless we make our hard copy. So notice that not just for the shallow copy, but also for arguments, beta, the dynamic data has changed. These are the arguments as well. So if you make a deep copy, and you change stuff, it doesn't destroy the original copy. <laughs> so you can send a reference to a function, and it gets treated like a value in the function, and then what happens in the function stays in the function, and then it goes back to main. So what does constant do? Makes a deep copy. <laughs> but does a you programmer know that? Probably not. 
But when you send an array to a function and you put the word constant there, it's like saying, hey, could you make a deep copy for me? I don't feel like bothering when I'm doing that for myself. Oh, no problem. You can make a deep copy. Okay, good. It makes a deep copy for you is what it does. It takes and allocates another set of memory, puts a label on it, initializes it. All the changes happen because it's going to happen anyway, right? Because a lot of people wonder, well, when you put constant there, how come nothing ever changes? It just doesn't save anything? Yeah, it saves everything. It's in a deep copy. So it creates the deep copy for you automatically. It uses the deep copy while you're in the function. You leave the function, deep copy goes away. It gets deallocated. Constant does everything for you, though. <laughs> so you can actually use the keyword constant on uh, member functions as well. And so anything that happens inside of the member function is made, a deep copy is made. So constant makes a deep copy, long story short. So now you know what deep copy is. Classes with data member pointers need all three. They need constructors, copy constructors, and deconstructors. All three of them are independent. None of them work with each other. They happen to share the word constructor in part of their names. But that's the only thing that makes them similar. They're, they have three different functionalities for the final exam. And I'm mentioning a lot of stuff about the final exam today because I'm not going to see you for two months. And you're going to come back and you're going to take the final exam. And there's, you can't prepare for it in one day on a Saturday to take it on a Sunday. I will definitely ask you questions about the differences between the copy constructor, the deconstructor, the, co the constructor. What does the keyword constant do? What is the deep copy? What's a shallow copy? Um, those are questions that are uh, <coughs> definitely, I, I looked at the exam actually before today, so I know those questions are, I can tell you 100% certainty you'll see questions about that. You'll also see questions about arrays on there too, two-dimensional arrays and stuff like that that I mentioned earlier already. I can't even remember what I said. What about the assignment operator? The default method uses a, used for the assignment for the class also makes a shallow copy. So you've got to make a deep copy. So on an assignment, one object equals another object. You're also working with a deep copy. If you don't have a copy constructor, nothing's going to deep copy for you. It's not like constant. If you put constant at the end of a method, that will automatically deep copy for you which is kind of odd. So constant is actually a pretty good word. So if your class has a data member pointer to by dynamic memory, you should write a member function to create a deep copy of the dynamic data. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. So now we have gamma, copy from beta. So we got the two. Take this one, copy it from the other one. We can also overload the assignment operator. The assignment operator. We can't do, we can't do overload. Can we do overloading operators in Java? Does anybody know? Can you overload an operator in Java? Yeah? Okay. I've never tried to. I don't like overloading operators, actually. Sometimes you have to, we're going to look at overloading operators next. <coughs> if the C in, the C out can be overloaded, the plus, the minus, stuff like that. But I don't like doing it uh, because then it, 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 you overload plus so it does minus instead of plus or something. Or, you know, it's like, uh oh. But when you're working with objects, how do you take one point that has an x and y and add it to another point that has an x and y without overloading that plus operator? So you overload operators to change the functionality of the operator so it adds more than just one integer on one side and one integer on the other side. You can add two of them together. And then you end up with a point that represents a true a plus b. <laughs> so anyway, that's interesting. We'll, we'll wake you up in the afternoon with operator after we take a short break after this lecture. But uh, all right, so this is the deep copy, and then we have uh, a method called copy from that we created. We don't necessarily have to use the deconstructor for, excuse me, the copy constructor. We can create our own methods that take a copy and make a copy of it from the copy. So, And on that note, it's time to take our first bio break after lunch. <laughs> so uh, 10 minutes or so, it's uh, yeah, about 10 minutes. Okay, see you in 10 minutes.